introduce myself, I'm Anne Apps, I'm a lecturer at Newcastle Law School and I'm here and I put this panel together with my colleague, my wonderful colleague, Sizzle Grimstead. Sizzle's a lecturer in the Business School, so we come under the banner of the Faculty of Business and Law uh, at Newcastle University and one of the things that has really drawn us two together, we're a bit of a team, came together a couple of years ago because we uh, both were interested in co-ops. I was an am still undertaking a PhD looking at uh, the impact of law and regulation on the cooperative business model. And Sizzle uh, had recently completed, or had completed a few years ago, her PhD, which included a component on eco-innovation. Um, so it wasn't actually on co-ops, but in, through looking at eco-innovation, uh, she spent, uh, she did a case study, an in-depth case study, on an apple growers co-op in Hardinia in Norway, which is of course her home country. And, uh, and she was really fascinated by what she discovered through that research and one of the things was that the co-op was very much the agent of that eco-innovation and I'm sure if she gets a chance she can elaborate on that a little bit further on. So we came together with this sort of uh, joint interest in co-ops and we found ourselves in a really unique situation in the faculty and that was that happened when we were joined by Professor Morris Altman, who is the Dean of the Business School, and Morris happens to also have a passion for co-ops, so a rare thing. And, uh, and Morris has been incredibly instrumental and supportive in setting up some education on co-ops, something that's uh, in short supply. You won't find uh, co-ops as an alternative business model in most uh, business law economics textbooks, they're missing. Um, but Morris was keen for us to set up something. We set up a postgraduate uh, certificate in uh, cooperative organisation and management and it's just, just finishing, thank you Jarrah, uh, it's third, it, it's third, Jarrah, Jarrah's just finished teaching uh, in the third trimester. We were delighted to have uh, Jarrah on board this time teaching a course that Joe has also taught for us previously on uh, social co-ops and social innovation. Um, so yeah, we've run two iterations, so it's at post-grad level, it's a graduate certificate. We've had a, a pretty good time of it in the last couple of years, um, mainly because last year we had, sorry, this year, uh, we had a run of um, students who were involved in the Farming Together pilot project. I don't know if any of you are aware of it, but the government, the Barnaby Joyce, had funded agricultural co-ops who were interested in, or agricultural entities who are interested in using the co-op model to increase their bargaining power, so it's sort of as a collective bargaining mechanism. We're given some funding to uh, start new co-ops or revive or rejuvenate, rejuvenate existing co-ops. And we had 48 of those people come through our courses this year, which was really a, a terrific experience because there were some really wonderful people doing interesting things to do with co-ops, um, mainly around agricultural co-ops, but they were from all around Australia, from, uh, we had quite a few from Perth, uh, from Western Australia, and quite a few, a lot from New South Wales, some from Victoria, a couple from Queensland. So it was a, a diverse bunch, and it was an, uh, we're a fully online program. So that's probably enough about um, the program, but it's worthwhile giving it a plug, uh, because training and education is, you know, certainly, it's certainly a passion, and, um, and as I said, it, it, it's lacking out there. So let me tell, me tell you a little bit about the panel that we've put together here. Um, we, came, we actually formed this idea a little earlier on in the year after Hamed had approached us kindly to be involved in this session to talk about co-ops um, as a pathway to an alternative future or certainly contributing to alternative futures. And I was at a seminar, I don't think Sizzle was there, but we were at Co-ops New South Wales had a seminar and Joe was there, Robin was there. Um, I don't know whether Jarrah was there at the time, but Robin was there and James Brown was there. <laughs> and Louise happened to be here. So James Brown is the CEO of Common Equity, which is a New South Wales peak body for cooperative housing. And uh, the wonderful Louise Crabtree just happened to come along and Louise knows a heck of a lot about co-op housing. So she agreed kindly to step in and fill the spot for us. So we're delighted to have her here. So let me introduce the panel. Um, at the end of the table, we have uh, Jarrah Hicks. Some of you probably know Jarrah, and she's a, a 
founder and director of uh, Community Power Ag Agency, and she's going to talk a little bit about uh, community-led initiatives so for community energy. So, it, so there's energy. Uh, Bronwyn and Joe aren't sitting together at the moment. Um, yeah, um, I think Bronwyn's going to do the talking, but Joe's going to come and join us on the panel. They're going to talk, and this is not in order because I'll tell you about the sequence in a minute. Uh, Bronwyn and Joe are going to uh, deliver their session last in the panel, and they're going to talk about platform cooperativism. Um, where's Stephen? Who tells me that's a mouthful? It is a mouthful. Um, yeah. <laughs> And uh, we have Robin Kaczmarek here, and Robin is uh, the founder of The Cooperative Life, uh, an up and running workers co-op, uh, delivering a cooperative, delivering, yeah, care, care services, and particularly in the aged care and NDIS, yeah, disability sectors. Um, so really wonderful to have someone on the panel with the experience that Robin's had that is sort of fresh because the co-op's growing. Uh, quite quickly and it's delivering something that's quite unique for what we see is, uh, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about precarious work. Um, so, um, and some of the, the themes of the conference, I, I think all start to tie in together. And um, when, um, I was just thinking, Sarah was talking before about an ethic of care. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm going to give you a really quick introduction to cooperatives. I'm sure that you're, uh, most of you are aware of co-ops as an alternative business model. We heard a little bit about benefit corporations earlier and I, I just wanted to sort of say a little bit about co-ops. I was thinking about how I would quickly explain co-ops to you and um, I remembered a quote about co-ops being the original co-op, the early development of, of the co-op and I'm talking about in the UK and not just in the UK, it happened spontaneously. So that the, the quote was that cooperatives were a spontaneous, voluntary and collective response to the worst impacts of the industrial revolution. And that's how uh, co-ops appeared spontaneously in the UK and across Europe in different forms. So in the UK, they appeared as workers' co-ops, uh, sorry, workers' co-ops, consumer cooperatives, um, following the Rochdales and or the Rochdale area was where one of the earliest sort of uh, forms of cooperative sort of solidified into something and we uh, accredit the Rochdale pioneers with the uh, co-op principles which are an incredibly important part of the co-op business model. Um, interestingly I think when you think about the Rochdale pioneers you think about co-ops. Co-ops are uh, should arise spontaneously as solutions to problems. So while I'm often pondering why there are not a, a lot of co-ops around, I think co-ops just happen, grassroots uh, emerging uh, as solutions to problems. And the Rochdale co-op appeared because people, workers in mining towns in the UK, couldn't, uh, they didn't have access to unadulterated, good quality food. And that's how the, they came together, pooled their resources to solve that particular problem. Uh, across Europe at the time, we had farmers uh, needing access to uh, funds and credit unions started to happen. And uh, in France and Spain and those countries, you had artisans who were displaced and workers' co-ops started to develop there. So I've just not long come back from uh, the second international forum on cooperative, international cooperative law in Europe. So can't come away from Europe with this whole sense of social solidarity economy and you can't take co-ops out of the social solidarity economy in, in Europe. They're very much embedded and are the early form of, of uh, business model in, in that economy. It, it is developing and, um, and Stephen, uh, was earlier on talking about some new models of social enterprise we hear, things like community interest companies, benefit corporations, which are new models of social enterprise, but I think it's worth remembering that co-ops were an early uh, version of social enterprise and uh, they, they are a dual output model. So the whole idea, oh, I know what I wanted to quickly talk about was that the company model as we know it today, the investor-owned company developed in the UK 
at around the same time as co-ops. They actually emerged at a very similar time in terms of their legal form. Um, and of course, a company is an investor-owned firm. It's profit-seeking and it seeks to maximise a return on capital. The co-op model emerged at the same time as a member-owned firm that was purpose-driven and it sought to distribute any surplus it had back to its members. So when you think about those two fundamental differences in legal form, and it, it's embedded in, in co-op's legal form, one is essentially distributive, collective, distributive, purpose-driven. The other is uh, capitalist and extractive um, and very individualist in hierarchy because the profit goes to the investor. Um, so it's extractive, it takes that profit out of resources and, and um, places it into the hands of a few. And we're seeing widening income inequality and part of the reason is because we have an extractive and not a distributive economy. So co-ops were always designed to be distributive and we're going to talk about that in a little while with, um, when we talk about platform cooperativism. Uh, one of the things that we've been concerned about in the last century as the, as the investor-owned firm has become the dominant model is that the, we have seen what we call isomorphism take place, which is that cooperatives started to look more and more and more like investor-owned firms. And the law hasn't always been effective in stopping that, that happen um, in certain situations. So uh, while, like I am quite passionate about diversity and I think diversity not in all things is a good thing and we need diversity of legal forms for businesses including social enterprises. There is always that concern that, uh, that a new model which is a tweak on an existing model might take attention away from that diversity and create a new type of isomorphism and that's always been one of my concerns with the Benefit Corporation. And uh, Sizzle and I and a few others here I think might have been at a session just recently where a very wonderful old cooperator who's the chairman of the board of CBH, the largest grain handling corporation in Australia, but it is a cooperative, a non-distributing cooperative, um, said it's always important to remember that legal form, legal structure will always determine who benefits. So um, that's something that we need to think about. Okay, so uh, I, I just, the last thing I wanted to quickly touch on to draw some themes together was that uh, not everybody here on the panel was here, but Raywin Connell, uh, her wonderful presentation on day one, she talked about some of the strategies uh, that uh, have resonance. So some of the strategies for an alternative future that have resonance with the cooperative form. One of them she talked about, the first one was sense of country and it's important to remember that uh, cooperatives are local solutions and because they're member driven, they are attached to place. And that's important when we think about how co-ops might perform in uh, the ecological sense. The other is know-how. Uh, she talked about know-how and uh, co the importance of collective know-how and co-ops are an adaptive and innovative model because they're always seeking new ways to accommodate their members' needs. So they've, they've proven themselves over time to be adaptive and innovative. Interesting, Co-ops UK, which has morphed from one of the earliest, the co-op wholesaling co-op society in the UK, was the first adopter of FPOS in supermarkets. That's where it started. And it's interesting how many innovations have come from the cooperative sector. I'm not saying it's good, but it's there. And they've had to be innovative to deliver member value. Raywin mentioned the decline in political education with the decline in the trade union movement and I was really quite taken by it. But I was also reminded that uh, co-ops are regarded as a training ground for democracy. It's where you learn about dem democracy um, and training and education is also a cooperative principle. The final and the fourth point that Raywin made was uh, the notion of transnational solidarity, and maybe not everybody realises, but co-ops are not just a business model. They are a social movement. They're an international social movement. 
and the International Cooperative Alliance, which sets the cooperative principles, reviews them every five years, um, provides cooperatives with transnational solidarity. And whilst Australia has been a long way removed from that solidarity and that conversation, I think that uh, as, we, um, as we seek ways to mitigate in the same way that co-ops arose to mitigate the harshest effects of the Industrial uh, Revolution, um, I think that uh, we will increasingly find some uh, connection through that transnational solidarity with cooperatives around the world as we seek to redress the harshest impacts of neoliberalism. So that's all I wanted to say, um, and I'm just going to hand over. So the way we'll do it is we're going to run through each uh, speaker who's going to present their little segment on, on, on their sector of uh, co-ops, and then we'll have a facilitated discussion at the end and then an open discussion. So, Dara. Uh, 